The amount of money parked at the Federal Reserve's reverse repo facility has just topped $2 trillion. So that's the highest it's ever been. And in this video, we're going to look at the reasons behind that, but also explain what reverse repo is and why this might matter anyway. So let's look at reverse repo in a bit more detail. Let's begin with the definition of repo and reverse repo. So here's the definition in terms of how the Federal Reserve sees it. A repo is a short-term transaction between a bank, say, and the Federal Reserve, where the bank gives some treasuries to the Federal Reserve, they then sit on the Federal Reserve's balance sheet, maybe overnight, and then the following day the whole thing is unwound, so the treasuries go back to the bank. Now cash moves in the opposite direction. The word repo just means sale and repurchase, and it's usually overnight, but it can be term repo, which can last maybe a week. But the net effect is to take treasuries off the balance sheet of the bank and put it onto the Federal Reserve's balance sheet. And that way the Federal Reserve injects money, liquidity, into the banking system. Hopefully the bank will then go out and lend money to the real economy, which is then stimulated. Now, as the name suggests, reverse repo is exactly the same thing, but in the opposite direction. So in this case, the Fed is actually draining liquidity or money out of the banking system and in turn, it's injecting treasuries onto the bank's balance sheet. Now, it doesn't have to be a bank. It could also be another type of counterparty, like a money market fund. And that's going to be relevant later on in the story. Now, the story of why reverse repo has spiked has five parts. And this is the first part of that story. And it's about banks having too much in deposits. You might be thinking, well, why would banks not want to have deposits? Isn't that their job? But remember, these are commercial banks and the deposits form the liability side of their balance sheet. This doesn't generate money for them. In fact, they have to pay out money to their customers who've made those deposits. So really, from their point of view, it's just a cheap form of funding. But the unwanted side effect of the huge surge that we saw in deposits around 2020 during the pandemic is that they now have larger balance sheets. And that's not a good thing from the bank's point of view. And the reasons for that are beneath me, which is that they have to have more regulatory capital. This is essentially dead money which sits with the Federal Reserve in a kind of account with them, and in order to ensure that we won't get another episode like 2008. But banks don't like it because it reduces their return on equity and their profitability. What banks want is to increase the number of loans they've got because that generates an income for the bank. That's their lending business. But unfortunately, we didn't see a huge rise in demand for loans at the same time as we saw that rising level of deposits. So overall, this was not a good development from the point of view of banks through this crisis and beyond. So this dead money, which sits at the Federal Reserve, is called the bank reserves. And you can see that those have spiked over the course of 2020 and 2021. And now even in 2022, they remain very elevated relative to their pre-crisis levels. Currently, there are about $3.3 trillion parked at the Fed, which belong to banks. Now, the Fed kind of let banks off the hook for a little while during the crisis by temporarily suspending something called the Supplementary Leverage Ratio Rule, and that actually reduced the amount of money that banks had to hold with the Fed in order for them to be able to lend to the real economy. So that rule was loosened in April of 2020, and that's the first dashed red line you can see. But then the Fed kind of took away its largesse in March of 2021. But unfortunately, the reserves that the banks held with the Fed didn't fall. And the net effect was that banks simply became less profitable. Their return on equity fell. What's also interesting is if you look at the Treasury general account, that's the blue line here, think of that like the checking account for the US Treasury or the US government. Because of all the bailout schemes which were required to smooth over the crisis during the pandemic, the US government issued a lot of debt and that temporarily boosted that account. But then, of course, the money was spent. And guess where it ended up? Yes, it ended up on the balance sheets of the commercial banks. So at the same time as the US Treasury general account went down, notice how the bank reserves at the Fed rose. So overall, the effect on the bank's balance sheets was not helpful for the banks. And that was important, as we'll see in a moment. So for the reasons we've just seen, banks were trying to stop companies from depositing their cash with banks. So where could companies stash their cash? 
Well, a traditionally safe place to park your money is with something called a money market fund. So that's exactly where commercial banks told their customers to put their money. Here's a story from the FT where JP Morgan Chase and Citigroup allegedly said to their commercial clients, look, don't give us your money, put it in money market funds because it's safe. And frankly, we don't want your money. So companies are putting their money into money market funds, but now so are retail investors. When I first made a video about the reverse repo market ballooning in size, there was a very buoyant risk appetite. That's because equity markets were just storming ahead and there was a huge amount of euphoria in markets. However, since the beginning of 2022, that's very much gone into reverse with sharp falls for the equity market, particularly the Nasdaq. And as people get more nervous, they're more worried about return of capital rather than return on capital. And so suddenly money market funds, which literally return almost nothing, but which preserve your capital, the deal is that if you put a dollar in, you can take a dollar out, those become much more attractive, even with high inflation, because at least you're not losing money on the capital which you've deposited. So the trend we've seen over the last two years is a huge set of inflows into money market funds. In fact, over that period, we've had about two trillion flow into those funds. Now, one of the largest money market funds in the United States is called the Vanguard Federal Money Market Fund. And if you look at the Vanguard website, they're very clear as to what they buy in terms of assets for the fund. Now, if you have to maintain the $1 value of the fund, what are you going to buy? Well, you're going to buy US Treasuries because they're very safe. So you can see US government obligations make up about 17% of the portfolio. US Treasury bills, which have a maturity of one year or less, make up about a fifth of the fund. But almost two thirds of the fund is in repurchase agreements. Remember that from the point of view of Vanguard, the reverse repo from the Fed's point of view is called a repo transaction. So the Fed's reverse repo is Vanguard's repo. What we've also seen since the beginning of 2020 is a rapid increase in the size of stablecoin. Now, these are very much like money market funds. Their goal is not to break the buck. They can never be worth less than a dollar and they're linked directly to the value of the dollar. So that means they're going to invest in very similar things to money market funds. Now, the overall market capitalization of stablecoin is currently significantly less than the entire money market fund industry in the US, but it is starting to become systemically important. If we add up Tether's market cap with that of USD coin, which are the largest stablecoins, the total is about $126 billion. Now, Tether isn't particularly transparent in what it holds, but USD coin is, and you can see what it owns above me here. And as of May 20th, you can see that it parked about 53 billion between a combination of about 13 billion in cash and about 40 billion in short duration US treasuries. So those are probably T-bills with a maturity of less than a year. So why would a company like Vanguard enter into something which is a little bit complicated, like a reverse repo that would confuse its clients? What I've done here is I've plotted the one month treasury yield. So that's a very short duration treasury and typically the kind of thing which money markets would love to invest in. And I've shown the yield for those one month treasuries. That's in red on this graph. And the blue line is the yield you'd receive if you enter an overnight reverse repo transaction with the Fed. Notice how the two track each other quite closely over time. So this was the last time we saw the Fed raise interest rates. And you can see that the one month treasury yield pretty much tracks the reverse repo rate over that period of time. But if you look at the most recent rates, you can see that the reverse repo rate is 0.8% and the US one month yield is about 0.55%. So from the point of view of the manager of a money market fund, you've got two choices. Would you rather have 0.8% with a reverse repo transaction with the Fed where you've got no counterparty risk, because remember the Fed has an unlimited balance sheet. You've also got no interest rate risk and you can still earn that 0.8%. Or B, would you rather buy a one month treasury, which is going to pay you 0.55% less, but with additional interest rate risk. So you can see from the point of view of the money manager, they definitely go for the one with lower risk and higher return, which is the reverse repo. So certainly the incentive at the moment is to have a preference for reverse repo, which is why so many money market funds are using that facility with the Federal Reserve.
If you enjoy these videos, then why not consider joining our online community? It's very engaging, it's very friendly, plus you get access to all sorts of goodies, such as our online chat application, Slack, so you can ask me a question anytime you like or other members of the community, and a growing library of members-only video content. To learn more about that, just click on the link beside me or in the description beneath me. So as we've seen, growing reluctance from banks to accept deposits from companies, but also growing fear amongst investors has driven a flow of money into money market funds. But we've also seen a big growth of stablecoin. Both of those have created a demand for short dated US treasuries. Those are called T-bills. But at the same time, there's been a lack of supply of those very T-bills. Of course, the Fed's been a big buyer of treasuries. It's bought about $5 trillion worth of notes and bonds. Those are longer dated US treasuries. But it also owns about $330 billion worth of T-bills. That's exactly what the money market funds are after. And of course, stablecoin now. However, if we look at the amount of actual paper which is out there, which these funds can buy, the T-bills, which have a maturity of one year or less, that's the red line you can see beneath me here, that's actually been falling steadily since the middle of 2020. Why is the US Treasury not issuing short-dated debt? Well, it probably wants to lock in low interest rates. It can see interest rates rising, so it's going to lock in, say, five-year, 10-year, 20-year bonds to keep that rate low for a long period of time. That way it costs less to service the US debt. And that's exactly what you can see above me here. So the notes which are outstanding, that's two to 10 years in maturity, have gradually been increasing in terms of amounts outstanding. And the blue line at the bottom of the graph is the amount of 20 and 30 year bonds. These are really long duration treasuries. The amount of those outstanding has also been gradually increasing. So there's a very clear demand supply imbalance here. Now you might think, surely the Treasury will help the situation by issuing more T-bills. Well, in fact, the US government has to issue even less debt at the moment because it's had bumper tax receipts. So you can see in April of 2022, there are huge receipts compared to the same time last year. One of the reasons for that is inflation, because if prices are higher and the US skims off some percentage of every transaction, then you'd expect its tax receipts to increase. So as long as the government's not spending more, which is the case at the moment, a lot of that fiscal largesse has now disappeared. So it really doesn't need to issue much debt at all in order to plug the difference between its expenditure and its tax income. So this will further squeeze the market in T-bills into the end of this year. So if money market funds want to get their hands on US T-bills, probably the best way to do that at the moment is to go via the reverse repo market. And that's exactly what we can see happening right now. Money market funds make up the bulk of the demand for these reverse repos from the Fed. So you can see why it's gone above $2 trillion. And in fact, I wouldn't be at all surprised if it went up much more. So in conclusion, I'd say the primary driver behind the demand for T-bills at the moment is due to people de-risking their portfolios and moving into safer assets, including money market funds. Those money market funds in turn have to buy safe assets, and that's driven a lot of the demand for T-bills and reverse repo as a way of getting them. Over the course of 2022, we've seen short-term interest rates increase from roughly zero to almost 2%. So the actual interest rate you receive for holding that very safe debt has increased significantly. It's still not huge, and in real terms it's negative with inflation above 8%, but it's a lot better than nothing. And many people see it as better than losing money in the equity market. So I think that'll further increase the demand for things like money market funds and also drive the demand for reverse repo higher. Now, as the Fed starts its program of quantitative tightening or QT, this might be a problem. Because remember what happens during reverse repo is the Fed is actually draining liquidity or cash from the banking system or from the monetary system overall. Now, at the same time, it's going to be shrinking its balance sheet and raising interest rates. So it's not just slamming on the brakes by raising interest rates. It's also shrinking its balance sheet and doing a lot of reverse repo. Now, if people are worried about a recession in the United States, perhaps this is going to create just a little bit too much tightening. Now, that won't be a good story for the equity market or for the US economy. 
Hopefully that's helped you understand how reverse repo works and the drivers behind it, but also I think a lot of those drivers are still in place during the course of 2022, even once QT starts. That's because it's fear, markets are still quite wobbly, so people are seeking a safe place to park their capital at the same time as there's a lack of supply of UST bills. Now don't forget our offer. If you want to join our online community, pensioncraft.com is where we manage it now. Just click on the link beside me and in the description beneath me. And as always, thank you for listening.